All right, Calvin, it's 10 o'clock if you want to get started on the employee onboarding. Uh, so, <clears throat> and Christine, you're helping me today in the panel. Who all do we have on this panel? Uh, I believe this was an open discussion for people to share ideas. How do they onboard best uh, to get people familiar with Epicor and get them up and productive as quickly as possible? That's super easy. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone who would like to uh, join in, please raise your hand or put uh, something in the questions and I'll unmute you as I can. But this was brought up as a, a topic by some people to know, hey, what are some good ways to onboard a new employee, get them up and going? What tools do you use? Uh, do you use training sessions? Do you use uh, one employee shadowing another employee? How do you help get somebody comfortable in Epicor quickly so that they're a productive member? What have you used in the past, Galvin? Oh, come on, Christine, I was going to let you go first, but I think it's easier just to hire somebody else as ERP admin. Right. Um, I, we, for the most part, have our, uh, we do job shadowing. Um, we used to, in the past, there was a, I can't remember what it was called. There was a training tool that we used from Epicor for a while uh, in our shipping and production areas. But we've since gone away from that and it's mostly we have our supervisors um, or another person in the department do the training of a new employee. Had, knowledge mentor was out there in the right past. that's what yes knowledge mentor that's what okay. we used to ask. but but you know in order to do that you also have to commit to continuing to update it as the versions updates and all that and eventually we we just didn't use it as much and we went away from it. Okay. Kim Lister says he also does uh, employee shadowing another employee. Employee shadowing is fine, but that's going to kind of create an issue with a replicate of fading mentality. I'm going to turn around, train this person. They're going to train this person. They're going to train this person. By the time I get to the third or fourth generation, it's not the same as what it was before. Which is kind of like what all of our grandparents say. You're going to destroy the world for me. Uh, it's going to get passed down generationally, and it's going to get worse and worse, and there's always the doom and gloom out there. Taking that tribal knowledge and converting it into the Epicor help system is what's kind of crucial. Um, putting together work instructions, how to enter a customer, what the fields mean. Um, people would turn around and write their work instructions. The quality manager would keep the book going and make sure that the documents are updated and work with HR to make sure that new recruits had that information so they could know how to use the system. Um, Epicor U has learning paths for a new job. How do I onboard a new accounts payable person? How do I onboard a shipping receiving person? What classes or videos do they need to watch to be able to perform their job function? That's using Epicor based product, no customizations. And then I find a lot of people have customizations here and there that don't get added into their employee training. Um, I generally recommend for a new person is put them through the uh, navigation system basics. These are just standard videos of how to get around an Epicor, how to do basic functions, how to query records. Uh, Mark, we're getting some background noise through you. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, it's just a, what, what Swiss Tech is apt to do is we, because of what, what you alluded to is, you know, customizations, but also 
Epicor has so many ways to do things. There are multiple ways to create an order. Uh, you can pull from the quote. You could. Different companies have focuses on different things. Make the make the job. Pull from inventory. All those different things. So we've done our own documentation. We had knowledge mentor. Never never really utilized it. Um, though it was a very interesting looking tool. We just never utilized it. So we just do Word documents. Um, our we're a company that's heavily order entry based. Uh, because we work out other people's product that they ship to us. So our order entry is a key step. That's where we started with. I mean, you know, the manual probably started at 10 pages and grew to 50 pages. There are lots of uh, print screens in there, um, you heavily print screens with information. So, and we've done that at order entry. We've done that at, uh, you know, how we enter customers. Again, some fields we don't use that other people may view critical. We've added custom fields there. So again, it's and we all those manuals are stored in SharePoint, so we have check in, check out as we update them. Uh, as others alluded to, it certainly is a challenge to keep those up to date as processes tweak. One thing, fortunately, through version eight, we skipped version nine and in the E10, the screens didn't really change that much. Certainly, some went through changes, so that was a good piece of it. And then the other thing we do is kind of what you alluded to, Calvin, was uh, we use. Uh, I guess the, the cool word, trendy word, is to use a SME, the subject matter experts. We just call them peer trainers. We have a peer trainer in each department to help try to prevent that process drift as person A trains B, B trains C, C trains D. We're always coming back to A, hopefully, uh, that's doing that training. Um, and so that's kind of how we approach it. So it's um, I'll use your people who are writing the process, determining the process, we'll use you know, the EPCOR documentation and our experiences. But then we have this, our manual is the Swiss tech way. You know, even on a simple invoice credit memo, there's a way that, you know, Epcor could allow you a couple different ways to do it. We want it done the same way every time because down the way it makes it easier. Person A didn't do it their way and person B didn't do it their way. And it rolls through differently. So, um, and part of that peer trainer, obviously for a while, they might watch somebody do an order for a couple of times and then they go do it themselves so that, that peer trainer does some shadowing and then they're working with them for a couple of weeks on depending on the task. So that's how we've, we've addressed it. I have not done a good job of using the Epicor videos. I think you brought up a good, a great point. No matter what you're doing in Epicor, those navigational videos would certainly be helpful. I just, we have not properly used, utilized those. And it's something I should look into improve to improve our training process because a lot of people just don't get the basics of Epicor. So. Yep. Um, and SharePoint, well, SharePoint, and I should, by the way, just to wrap that up, sorry. SharePoint is a big part of that for ease of checking in, checking out. People can't edit it. Also helps us with our ISO, on our ISO side. We are ISO certified, and so that helps with all the you know, check-in, revision approvals, et cetera, that type of thing. So thank you. Now, are you also embedding the SharePoint link inside your Epic or Help? We have not done that. That may make it easier as well for the common task for a new yeah. person doing new customer entry, hit F1 and see the link to SharePoint right there. They may not remember the SharePoint link all the time. Yep. But by putting that into the help annotation under the company, everybody then has access to it. That is something I'll have to go back and look into. So thank you. Okay. Um, the other thing is outside of Epicor use learning path videos, there's a boatload of the third party consultants and partners that have done the exact same thing. YouTube training videos, how to do this, how to do this. Taking a look at what matches yours or taking the training video as an outline to make your own. Mark, your order entry, like you said, is heavily customized. You're not going to fit anybody's cookie cutter for order entry. Um, but using the video for a process of, oh, how did they do it? How did they make the video? And what all they put in there? That might be some good information for helping make the videos for yourself. And then just storing the MP4 files up on your SharePoint as well with the document. People don't always learn the best from watching a movie, but they're going to get a whole lot further, I think, than reading the manual. 
or reading, this is what the standard manual says how to do it. I know when we do module trainings with customers, they have us record the session so they can embed it in the help or keep the videos on file. A lot of people are keeping Teams video archives and go to meeting video archives a whole lot further. I know Teams just shorten their policy on how long they'll keep it because people were putting so much out there. When COVID came out, it was a, hey, this is great. We can record all of our Teams meetings. Anyone can go back and read the transcripts or watch the video. When you spread that across the world, that's a whole lot of data being stored. So I know Teams turned around and modified their policy on how much you can leave up in your OneDrive. So we had to go out and go, no, you can't get rid of our stuff until we download it all. Okay, we have a couple of things uh, from Becky Starr. They use Epicor Knowledge Mentor to create training doc documents that encompass specific steps and customizations. Perfect. From Mike, could you elaborate on converting tribal knowledge to Epicor help system? So just taking your own screens and making your own video, um, even just have the people do a Teams meeting in your office record the session of one person training the other person how to do it downloading and saving that video on your server and putting a link to that file inside your epicor help so when you're in epicor help um, if your user security allows for company annotations or user annotations, you do have to have those permitted for you to be able to see them and edit them. As long as you have that, people can press the F1 help key inside Epicor. On the bottom left-hand corner should be a green tab that says annotations. And when you click on that, It'll show you your annotations for the company, for the user, as well as the Epicor help system all at the same time. You do have to hit the little push pin to get it to stick so it doesn't collapse back down to a tab. But this way, people can put a link to a training video. Hey, this is the navigation video that we teach. Because, yes, when you go to Epicor, you're going to see a navigation video for Kinetic, a navigation video for Metro, a navigation video for Classic. Which one are you using within your company? Because that's the video you want to embed and share with your people. Or make your own video, store it up on your own server, and then that becomes the process that everybody learns by and they don't have to worry this person did this and this person did this and they were totally different, but yeah, they kind of got to order entry. They just got there two different ways. And with Epicor homepage, you could actually have that link to SharePoint be a tile on everybody's homepage. So it's very easy to get to. Um, from Gerardo, uh, sorry, Gerardo Lopez, how are other people handling conversion of advanced classic screen customizations to work with Kinetic? We have many customizations that are like whole applications within an Epicor screen with functionality such as sending emails, manipulating files, complicated decision-making, UD table storage. Fred, Fred, let's go ahead and move this one to the stump the jump questions because this is really not longer. about Epicor training yeah. as how do I move to Kinetic smoothly? Um, Lisa McCarty, is it possible to get a license for a few people to access education modules instead of paying for all users? We use the education system and then create our own documents. We don't want to pay for the education for all users. I don't think Tim and Kim can probably advise to this as well, but I don't think you can say, oh, I want an education for five users. My license is for 25. You get 25 embedded education licenses for 25 users. It matches your user count on the license purchase. Also, Dr. Kim, um, there's, I don't want to say there's all these rules, but Say that you know, talk to your camera and find out what what the current policy is. 
if you if you go to uh, if you go to the cloud version, I believe that a lot of the information is available because you're in the cloud. Okay. Uh, the next one's a stump the chump, and then the next, the last one we have from Tim Lester. We have a general Epicor manual we created with specific instructions, and it's a link that is default on all user profiles. For example, we have a section that details new part entry with our default part number layout and format of descriptions. That's a great idea, Tim. Oh, come on. You're not going to get random part numbers shoved in that make no sense through your nomenclature? Well, that's another discussion. You need to have BPMs that restrict you from putting in random part numbers. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, have, um, I have an experience with a customer that was initially back 12, 13 years ago. Now, they were a very large company, and so their, their problem wasn't onboarding new employees. It was getting all... Uh, in their sales organization, for example, I think it was all 20 people who enter sales orders the same way. You can imagine you've got 20 sales order entry people all entering the same kind of orders that were complex. They wanted to have the orders have the same look and feel. Um, that's even down to which line items you entered first on an order. So. What they did was, and it, I thought it was very strange at the time because but they knew their organization really well. They created a separate document. It was literally a, they tried to keep these less than two pages, but a lot of times they were just one page that said, here's how to enter this type of an order. Here's what it should look like. Here's how, and they, they put those down. They created procedure numbers for each one. So by the time they were done, they had like 90 or 150 procedures in this book. And it was literally a book at that time. I would probably suggest doing it electronically now, but at that time it was a book. And then they did train to the book, but on go live day, when they were bringing up the software, they everybody had a copy of the book and they started entering order and if they had a problem, somebody would call up to the desk and say, hey, I can't figure out how to do this. And the person who made the book said, oh, well, go to procedure number 30. There's how to do it. And basically, they had mapped out how to enter every single book. And you could just follow the, follow the steps. Very, very simple, straightforward. Um, they created this book with these Procedures with a very standardized look and feel on every page. So then including screenshots and so just another idea, throwing it out there. Yep. But getting it out of somebody's head is the crucial part in getting it documented. Calvin, you've got a question from Pierre Hogue. Yep, about the annotations. Are they saved within the current open section only when we add them? Example, I've opened sales order entry and add an annotation. In the future, it will only be showed under the sales order section. Or all annotations are visible entering from entering the help. This would be tied to sales order entry annotations. So it would be tied to the specific item into the specific help module. On the Epicor system management module, and I know I'm going to stumble because I haven't seen the menu lately, um, there should be a help annotation section where you can look at what annotations you put in. If you have rights to manage them or edit them, you can go in and do that. So you can also see what policies and procedures you put into your system for people to follow. I recommend this to all of my customers because it becomes the easiest way to do an upgrade. Here's your process map. Go into the test environment we upgraded to Kinetic 2021 and walk through each of these processes. 
do they all come out the same way? Do the orders calculate correctly? Do commissions calculate correctly? When we print the sales order acknowledgement, does it look the same as what was in the manual? If it's just black ink on white paper, that doesn't mean it printed correctly. It just means it printed. You need to make sure that your customizations, your modifications to the reports were also included in the upgrade path. By having a well-defined process step such as this, okay, order entry process for this type of order. Here you go, here's the manual. I can give that to anybody to go enter and make sure that the new software works correctly. It will make your upgrades in the future that much smoother. And you won't think, oh my gosh, I forgot how to do AR invoice entry. There was a process for that. Follow that process map with the new software version. Make sure that it functions the same way. Your processes may need changes and updates. The screens are going to look different if we go from, kinet, uh, from classic to kinetic. So we may need to upgrade screenshots and manuals in the step of the process. So if you want to put in that link in the software, what version or what type of menu this works for, or what versions of the software it works for, that would be good too. Because order entry in Kinetic is going to look a whole lot different than order entry in Classic. Um, these company manuals and work instructions just make it easier to onboard people in the future. We now have a standardized path that everybody walks through. We make sure that they got the same. We did one thing better here at Code Bears. We tested people periodically. Did you watch the video? Did you practice it? Did you learn it? Are you ready to move on to the next step? Just got to make sure that I didn't just watch the movie. I learned from the movie as well. Um, and then my last step note here is kind of how do we make an employee better? Um, getting people to drive and motivate themselves to go up and beyond, this is going to be an individual thing per each employee. But how do I make them better? Um, Bad plug, but at Code Bears, we have a YouTube channel of all of our training videos in one continuous loop. You can play this for free in your break room. If people are in the break room and they see a tip on how to navigate or how to personalize columns or grids like Kim was doing with adding sums and grouping by dates, if they can take one tip a week, by the end of the year, that's 50 tips they walked away with, and you didn't have to pay for them to go to a class. The movie was just playing in the break room on, in the background. So from 10 o'clock until 2 o'clock, the heavy launch hours, we just turn around and play these videos in a continuous loop. YouTube allows you to build channels, so it doesn't have to be just the Coda Bears channel, you can mix and match your own videos into this large channel and have a continuous play that employees see this as it's running in the background. They're not going to pay 100% attention while they're on their lunch break, but periodically they're going to look at the screen and that's when we hope they walk away with a piece of information. I know I babbled an awful lot, but Christine, I want to pass it over to you. Yeah, I have a question uh, that Caleb and I was messaging back and forth to the group. So, and Mark brought up a lot of points, you know, and how they're having everything, uh, you know, in share points and whatever. One of the things that we sometimes run into is users don't follow the instructions or the documentation. They find new ways or they just, you know, because again, there's multiple ways of doing things in Epicor. How, how do you handle such things? Method and data directives can enforce people to move from field to field, control what data values go in a field. You can turn around and lock it down. That just takes more programming time to write all those directives. But if you have an employee that's not following the rules, odds are it's not just with Epicor, they're going to be a special person. 
you know, today I'm just not going to park where I normally am. I'm going to take the president's parking spot. <laughs> um, the second, the second not question. Very, yeah, that's not good for your longevity. <laughs> <laughs> and the second question, follow up was, well, who has the authority to lock the process down? You know, is it is it IT? Is it the um, you know the admins? Is it the the, the supervisor? Where, where does that lay? So where does other company have that? Make working that with the ERP administrator, the ERP administrator is going to work with a programmer to develop the directives with the business unit owner. Because if okay. the business unit owner is the one that raises the red flag and says, "I got people that can't follow the rules." Okay, is this we need to take a ruler to the knuckle or we need to build a process inside Epicor? It's only an Epicor they're messing up. Right. Epicor you can control. Well, I, I will say this that, and I, I've said this a lot in, in front of customers, so I'll say it in front of all of you that if you have an employee that is refusing to properly follow your procedures, that's an employee problem. Now, if they do a mistake, that's different. And mistakes happen. But then if you have somebody that just stops doing their cycle counting, I can't I can't solve that with a BPM. And exactly. they're, they're right. breaking procedures. And as the president of the company I used to work for 23 years ago, when he called in the, the person in the stock room and said, why did you stop doing cycle counts? And she said, well, I forgot because, well, you forget again and you don't have a job. It's that right. simple. That's your procedure. That's what right. your job is. And I can't, I can't enforce it. I mean, the only enforcement is to validate that they did it, but you know, it's. Yeah, sometimes so, it, it, it might be the scenario where it's not necessarily that they're not completely not doing something, but there might be two ways, right? And so. Right. They're used to the one way, and maybe the recommendations is now that we've done some process updates, or that hey, this is a better way to do things, and but we revert back to the old ways, or um, just some of the scenarios that we've been contemplating. You know, is there ways we should be handling that? Um, and that's the best way to do it. If you have a situation where it's easy to do it wrong, or oh wow, this is easier. They don't know that they're supposed to do it a different way. Right. Um, you have the scenario where you have 20 data entry people. It's, it's just a good practice to create a BPM that does some validation. It says, hey, this is the way we do it. And if you have a physical, you, know, you need to have it done a certain way, make a BPM. Make sure that they've done everything the right way. Let it do your own validation. That's what BPMs are for. Honestly. Looks like Mark has his hand up as well here. Mark, you want to mute yourself? Oh, apparently I've muted you as well. Now try. Now I'm trying. Thank you. Um, you know, along those lines, I mean, I do agree with, first of all, I'd like the electric shock mouse. That's what I've wanted for 19 of the 20 years we've been in business. Um, <clears throat> I understand that. I think we've made pretty good use of BPMs. I mean, the problem is you almost end up with a BPM on every field. Um, so where do you draw the line on that? But they are a great tool to keep critical data accurate. Um, you know, and, and as far as people problem, yeah, there's a lot of that. We have, we have we have an employee who looked me in the eye and said, well, you know, I don't really read that stuff. And I'm like, they don't report to me, I couldn't fire them. But the other issue right now is in today's workforce, if you fire somebody, you may not be able to replace them. So, it's but it is but, sword right now. But it, you know, for as much as you know, over the years, I've had a love hate relationship with Epicor. I have we have way more employee problems than we have Epicor problems. You know, I mean, and and trying to get them on track. And and you're, I understand that's the topic here with onboarding, but it's not a clear answer. But it's an HR issue and how how the company deals with it. You know, and as far as ownership, like we're a small company, so the ownership of it ends up kind of in my lap is the Epicor in-house, I'll use the word expert loosely, but you know that I help work with people and set from what I see on Insights and others and set the procedures. Because again, like you said, there's two ways to do it. 
way, way back deep inside, there's a reason why we want it done this way. And, you know, yes, if somebody pushes, well, I'll happily explain it to them. And usually their eyes glaze over 20 seconds into the why we're doing it, method A versus method B. But it's the employee issues are way harder than writing the documentation. I got to the point where I don't even really like writing documentation. People just ignore it anyways. But you got to try. And you got to, from an HR standpoint, you have to put the procedures in place. Otherwise, you have no recourse against people not following procedures if you don't have the procedure. So yeah. it's, it is a vicious circle cycle that if I had the answer to, I'd be retired. So the other thing I've been doing, Mark, in the training classes of modules with clients is when we go through the fields on the screen, why we're not using field or what values should we be putting in the field? Because if they come back three months later, oh, let's decide to do standard costs instead of average. They need to know what it's gonna impact and what all they need to change. But if they don't know what the fields represent or how to manage them, they can't move the software forward. So we've taken more of a, give the person the knowledge as to why we're deciding not to use a field or why we don't do some of the other 10 methods to enter an order. So that when people watch the video, they also know, oh, you're not the first person to think we should just use quick order entry. No. It doesn't work for your business. And I think that certainly, you know, I always believe that giving more people more knowledge is a good thing. Again, I think that comes down to the level of personnel you're training and, and their interest. You know, some will take it seriously and listen to it. And others, like I said, you see them glazing over right. it, <laughs> in the critical part. But again, it, it's a tough time right now. It, it always has been. I mean, even, even in 2011 when we were hiring like crazy and the job market, the unemployment was much higher and people were, there were more people that wanted to work. It was still hard, but it's, it's really difficult now. So. If people truly understand why they're doing something or why they need to do something, I generally find they don't have a problem. It's when they don't understand everything that's going into the why. It's not that they're maliciously bypassing the process. They just don't think there's any value. So as long as they know the value in doing it and why we chose it, I've never seen employees just turn around and maliciously go the other way. Oh, I don't think I anybody wants to do that. I, but oh, I, I have. Think I've seen it. Okay. Full circle, though. Yeah, I think it does. It does start with, for sure, starts with the onboarding as to how do you train the people to begin with. Um, challenge could be if you have documentation or training one way, but then when you get to your peers that might be doing things differently, where do you, you know, for a new person that gets can be tricky, but. I agree. I think it's, you know, how do we better write down the documentation for our new employees uh, across the board? Um, we've been talking about how do we do that when we get to our to kinetic screens, because that's a great, great way to revamp everything. You know, we've been on Epicor for almost 10 years. Um, there's a lot of good and bad habits probably in our users that we can maybe readdress with kinetics. With yep. the kinetic screens. Or re review the processes and redocument them with the kinetic strings, and this is our new manual moving forward. That's, but I would yeah. say go towards video so that you have a good record for it. Yeah. All right. It is 10:30, so let's switch our topic over to Application Studio. Uh, Dylan, are you the initial person, or is Caleb? Uh, Caleb's on functions with me later at one. I'm the only one on Application Studio. You're the only one on Application Studio. Sorry. Okay, Fred, the moon oh, so if anybody has any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. We can still take a look at them and reply back. Any questions you have about employee onboarding or tips to make it go easier documenting your processes. Go ahead and just put that in the chat or send an email. And Russell, we didn't forget about you. We'll put yours in with the Stump the Chump questions as well. Uh, Calvin's going to gather up everything that's in the questions area that hasn't been answered, and we'll put those into the Stump the Chump 